and hi y'all once again and before we get into the primarily observational studies a few of them going to deal with the vaccine as a reference to or allude to I should say pandemic mitigation strategies where the collateral damage from um, those strategies what is the outcome you'll see what I mean in a second but to proceed first this is the first study we are going to review a reference to pretty dramatic mutations resulting in reducing vaccine effectiveness. But what I also want to point out too is a lot of our data analytic or data collection sites have gone debunk. Let's just say it's COVID data collection fatigue. So what I'm doing right now is I'm going to pull the information directly from the CDC. And the CDC, eh, they have the data, but it's all in multiple data frames. So a lot of merging takes place before you we get what you see right before you. And what we are going to do is compare, for example, the case rate and other things as well. Uh, per 100,000, which we have to do on our own uh, because they only do work off of totals. They don't break it by 100,000. And if you don't go by 100,000, then you really don't have good comparison. You're not comparing apple to apples. You're comparing apple to oranges because of different population bases, so on and so forth. So, for example, we're going to compare the new cases per 100,000 tight restriction states as of January 2021 to basically new cases per 100,000 on states which have no mask mandates or loose restriction states or are going to become loose restriction states or no mask states as of January 2021. So what I did is I redid the graphs and charts so they have a better appeal on video. But to proceed as follows, to get right into the research as we begin. Study of coronavirus variants predicts virus evolving to escape current vaccines. Now think about this. Any virus that it basically is introduced into the uh, wild, especially its first year or two, is going to have a lot of androgenic drift, if not possibly androgenic shift. Now, for example, in the beginning, uh, my hypothesis was to the rapid change in the, vac the virus uh, mutations was because many of you may have forgotten that a lot of people were attempting to make their own vaccines. Now, where they were getting strains of the virus, so they were using viruses for variants of the virus, which were not, um, which were common in the wild, but not easily transmissible or had no negative effect. I don't know. But for example, you had heard those stories quite uh, often in the first few months of the uh, pandemic, where you heard about basically jerry-rigged vaccines. Now, if you're producing vaccines, for example, and it's not done in a controlled setting, you get the picture. But to proceed as follows, the virus escaping potential vaccines as follows. Look how fast this happened here. The company reported on January 28th that the vaccine was nearly 90% effective in the company's UK trial, but only 49.4% effective in the South African trial. Now, let's go a little further down the line. This is how fast it loses its potency in reference to certain strains. So the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine were less effective against neutralizing the two variants of B117, which emerged last September in England, and B1351, which emerged from South Africa in late 2020. Against the UK variant, neutralization dropped by roughly twofold, but against the South, against the South African variant, it dropped by six and a half to eight and a half fold. Now that's just to give you an idea exactly how fast uh, the situation changes or rapidly changes, especially since you're dealing with a relatively new uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is finding its place in the um, environment, so to say, or the ecosphere. And of course, there's gonna be a lot of mutations uh, and, of course, there's going to be a lot of drifting, especially individuals, which could become uh, what we used to call wild excretors, a reference to polio and so forth, so on and so forth. So what it's alluding to here is this. It, to assume that the vaccine is going to be your bailout would be to, you know, dress an individual with a parachute, uh, which may or may not be effective, but at the same time, too, giving them the impression that that parachute is 100% effective. Better to know and not jump from the plane than not to know and jump. 
You understand what I mean? All right, second story at hand. Face masks are a ticking plastic time bomb. This is just one dimension. Wait till we get to the element of the effect of hand sanitizers uh, by the millions and millions and millions of gallons being dumped into the ecosphere as well. But let us proceed as follows. This is our second story on mass disposal. Reese actually third. Recent studies estimate that we use an astounding 129 billion face masks globally every month, and that is 3 million a minute. Now, here's the issue at hand. Basically, as follows. We know that like other plastic debris, we're going down here, disposable masks may also accumulate and release harmful chemical and biological substances, besides breathing in, breathing out, and wearing on your skin, such as bisphenol A. You didn't think about bisphenol A being inside a uh, surgical mask. Heavy metals, as well as pathogenic microorganisms. These pose an indirect adverse impact on plants, animals, and humans. Now, I remember before, too, one of the primary disease-causing vectors of uh, SARS-CoV-2 was, do you recall, people throwing their masks on the ground. And they became like little vector bombs as far as uh, biological um, impediments. Let's put it that way. And so, for example, in the beginning, where did they find a large amount of airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2? Around the trash cans. Something to think about. And still, that has not been addressed. But researchers are doing a pretty good job of looking at that and beginning to take into account that something needs to be done now, otherwise this will come back and bite you in a way which is, I mean, as many of these plastic bags, you see that, uh, in ways which are not anticipated. Next, trivia, but still important. Impact of lockdown drives us to make poorer choices. All right, could be possibly the lockdown itself, but again, that's publisher bias. The study concludes that the shock produced by the situation has reduced people's cognitive capacity leading them to take more risk despite the risk of contagion and making poor choices, including a tendency to be less altruistic and the desire to punish others. I think a lot of us have uh, at least observations in our own personal spheres in reference to people acting hostile towards one another in ways which would not have occurred prior to the pandemic, nor in ways which we've anticipated from individuals which happen to be close to us. So again, interesting as far as how it actually can reduce the cognitive capacity of the population as a whole. Again, one more element of the potential collateral damage due to the COVID. And here we go next. Real world data, ah, real world data reveals risk of allergic reactions after receiving COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. All right, let's read this, the excerpt right here. Among the 52,805 employees, uh, including an estimated 4,000 significant allergies to foods, who were surveyed, again, this is a survey, who received the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine, 2% experienced allergic reactions. Now, remember, I'm always a big uh, advocate at risk-to-benefit ratio. If you're in a certain age group and the risk of SARS-CoV-2 is 99.4% or uh, 0.06% or whatever it is, and then 94 percent you know, you can be asymptomatic, you're okay, then why risk a 2% chance of allergic reaction or anaphylactics? Here we go. Or an anaphylactic rate of 2.47 per 10,000 individuals. Now, it's not so much the reaction to them, and they say that's largely comparable with other common antibiotics. Think about that. The wording. Why would you compare, do you get it right now? Why would you compare the allergic reaction to antibiotics to that of a vaccine? You see the wording, how you could have an unconscious bias. I'm not saying that's the individuals here which did Massachusetts General Hospital, but still, I mean, how is this compared to other vaccines? Remember, you're vaccinating a large scale. But here's the disturbing part. The CDC, which we're collecting the data from, and they're great people at the CDC, 
but still, just the same. The CDC intervention put the rate at 0.025 or 0.11 per 10,000 vaccines. So think in your head, going from a 0.025 to a 0.11 per 10,000 vaccines to a 2.47 per 10,000 individuals. Same thing right there. That is way off on the estimation. Way, way off. Which also means, too, that basically during the trials, that could have been the results that were presented to the CDC. So I can't blame it on the CDC. But if they were presenting that information from the manufacturers, and the CDC is just basically uh, parroting the information from the manufacturers, don't blame them. But however, though, Massachusetts General Hospital, still just the same, picked it up. And they also that data was definitely way off. Way, way off. If you want to work out the data to how many times off that is from 0.11 people per 10,000 to 2.47 per 10,000 individuals, put it in the comment section. I already could do it in my head, but still, I just like to see if uh, any of you, other you out there, other you out there, it's late. It's always it's an oral challenge to speak past midnight, but still just the same. Here it is, 0.11 to 2.47. How many fold was the CDC off? And again, it goes down to a lot of the pandemic mitigation strategies. Uh, when you have elements which are wrong often, when do you start questioning the credibility of the capability of leading and making policy changes among the rest of us? To proceed as follows. I mean, if your doctor was wrong that often, would still be your doctor. Proceed. Now is the time to study the impact of the pandemic on mothers and babies. And this is part of the collateral damage aspect. Again, I'm not going to work with weaponized uncertainty going, well, if a person was vaccinated, this or that, or whatever it came down to be, you know, you know, if you, if you go to a, you know, a concert and you could transmit the virus and someone in, you know, from Texas travels to New Jersey and someone in New Jersey goes to a retirement home and that person in retirement home then travels there and a person going to have a, a bad reaction or poor outcome due to someone going to a concert in Texas, they could die in New Jersey. Not going to go into weaponizing uncertainty. But it's our future which I'm really concerned about. And this is part of the collateral issues that have to be addressed. Uh, we can't look at things myopically, so to say. Uh, basically, we're planning our futures. But again, that's me on a pedestal. Here we go. If the past natural disasters have taught us anything about the effects on pregnant women and developing babies, it is time to pay close attention. For the added stress will surely have an impact on them. Uh, they're sounding alarm as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic because, again, what's happening now can affect the immune system of the future generations. And if you think wearing a mask and distancing is going to strengthen the immune system of future generations, well, good for you. There is strong evidence to suggest that the coronavirus pandemic will affect mothers and infants through immune pathways and in previous research has been shown to link stress and social isolation during the pre- and postnatal periods with deficits, deficits in maternal mental health and infant well-being and development across developmental stages. Food for thought. Again, what we do today has impact. It's a ripple effect. But this ripple effect goes multi-generational. So it's important to look now. Next. Now, this article is interesting because this article has a statistical significance in reference to basically mask reducing uh, oxygen or exercise capacity. But however, though, it's the interpretation of the statistical significance uh, to an individual exercising. You'll understand what I mean in a second. So what happens is studies suggest wearing a face mask during intense exercise is safe for healthy people. All right, this comes down to this. Results of the test showed that wearing a face mask had a small effect on the volunteers. For example, there was an average reduction. Now, they worked out for, I believe, about 30 minutes or so. But the full published study is not public. You have to pay for it to see it. And it's a small study. And to be very honest, the researchers were wonderfully open about their feeling and how, you know, they had to do this freely. This was not actually a paid research. So it's ended up happening. People going, oh, face masks don't do this. Face masks don't do that. But reality there are very few studies being uh, incorporated because if people uh, are conforming to behaviors without having to be rationalized or justified, 
then why do the study? Because studies are really just done to um, validate information. And it often you have to wonder if it's basically the people making policy who want to be validated or the science. But to proceed, a 10% reduction in the ability to perform aerobic exercise. All right, after about 30 minutes. And the research, in it, and when you think about it, this is a hard hit area. They're calling for additional research, but they did this research with volunteers on their own uh, free will and cognizance, which this should have been something which, especially for individuals in the military or sports, you know, athletics and so on and so forth, in other high risk positions which require a lot of physical exertion, uh, you would think someone would throw a little bit of money their way to do a decent, uh, a larger study, but these are individuals that have to volunteer. And again, that comes down to the data analytics and data collection. So you have to play into a role with a lot of data analytics and data collection in reference to the beginning of this pandemic were done through volunteers, where there's trillions of dollars being spent in reference to uh, the coronavirus. Very little is actually done in areas which are the most important to us. So again, that's my grandstanding. All right, let's get right into data analytics as follows. Ba -ba -ba. All right, here, let's go to the first one. No, 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 no. Let's go to the world data first. So here's our world data. Do, do, do. All right. This is what we're looking at so far. So here we are as far as our world data. This is basically our new cases smooth and new deaths smooth. You notice a little bit of a rise there in cases, but a drop in the deaths. You'll see more than a second. Here's your mortality percentage of positive cases. Remember, this is global and working from our world and data, which is actually a really good data collection site, but it's more global as opposed to working at an individual state level like we have here. So mortality percentage of positive cases, see that, boom, 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 da, 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 a little small graph, small graph, new cases smooth to new death smooth. Again, a lot of different variants out there and cases could be asymptomatic, it could be in a healthy population, so on and so forth, but I'm watching this drop right there. Mortality percentage, dropping about, about down to about the exact same level in January and almost the exact same level back in February. Now, the reason that's important is this. Back in February of last year, we were truly only testing the most vulnerable populations, and that was primarily the elderly. And now we're you know, we're testing everybody. So when you're only testing a small percentage of the population, and it's the vulnerable part, you expect to see a higher mortality percentage. What happened here and here? But here is we are now. And so let's keep on going. New cases moved per million to do Great Britain. Look at that. Great Britain in cases now, even though this UK variant are down below Sweden. Now Sweden is interesting because they started raising their mask levels. Not mandatory yet, but the more they started focusing on the coronavirus, even this late in the game, the cases began to go up. Again, is that selection bias, more testing out of concern of the coronavirus and so forth, so picking up more uh, asymptomatic cases? I don't know. But however, the mortality rate, just the same, has gone down. Uh, USA, look at this. Boom, boom. It's interesting how the USA and UK are so parallel with each other. And of course, our Asian friends never entered the game. All right, new cases, see Sweden there? Boom, boom, this the past 30 days, right up there. And then here is USA and there's Great Britain. And so here we are, new cases per million. The red represents the rapid drop. Remember we first started that, seeing that in January 4th, you and I, and look, it's still going down. Case to positive rate, Interesting here, the positivity rate seemed to take a little bit of a data, data rise, and then, but however, though, it's still dropping as far as um, new cases per million. And so here we are, new cases per million smoothed. Do, do, do. There we are there, new cases, new tests per thousand. Let's just go this way. All right, deaths per million. Sweden is still below, even though it's interesting how the cases went up, but the deaths per million is still pretty low. It hasn't changed that much actually uh, since um, early March. But here we are as far as USA, and here we are as far as our Asian friends. So the United States right now, if you look at right here, is down to about 4.283. 
and the new deaths per million in Sweden. You notice they also changed a little bit in their data collection. Uh, that, well, I'll take that back. I strongly doubt that the 2.504 is either backfilling or forward filling the data, uh, but it's pretty much the same area. Backfilling and forward filling means that there's, they may, over the weekend per se, if they're not collecting data, they just carry the 2.4504 forward. All right, new deaths per, per million USA, new deaths Sweden, do do do. Comparison, 4.28. Even though the case rate is higher than the United States, the mortality rate is half. So think about that. Uh, da, 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 we saw that. Remember our comparison here, new deaths USA versus all of Asia. Whether we like it or not, it is vital that we have a good concept because uh, we are not, as opposed to trying not to be geocentric, like it's all about us. Like how is the rest of the world doing? Well, here is the United States, new deaths. And thank goodness there's less. But look again, our Asian friends, I'm talking all of Asia, uh, never really entered the game. So selling a vaccine to them is going to be a hard push. So here we go. Two deaths per minute, total deaths per million USA versus all of Asia. Again, Armenia uh, is usually our closest uh, competitor in that level, unfortunate uh, competitor in that level. And we keep on going down. Total mortality USA versus of all of Asia. Now, again, before we look at the population, that's India. That's USA. And the weird part about it is a lot of my friends, which are follow COVID pretty heavily, a lot of them, a lot of conspiracy theories pop up. Uh, let's say, for example, they're embellished or embellished or immersed, I should say, in COVID, where they say they're, they're not reporting the data and there's bodies in the rivers and bodies at the border and they're huge pits. It's interesting how, you know, that mindset takes place. These are advanced societies and cultures. And if things like that were occurring, then that's in the can't, the probability of being exposed would be much higher than just word of mouth. So here we proceed forward. Do, do, do. And here we go. So Asia's total mortality, we have 409,386 out of a population of 4,463,000,000. U.S. mortality, 534,291 out of a population of 329,000,000. Think about that. All right, that means... We have one death in Asia now for every 10,901. One death in the United States now for every 615. Pretty uh, astounding ratio, bizarre and unfortunately very tragic. But again, it's important not to be geocentric. And what is Asia doing differently? I'm talking areas of Asia, which are uh, different different pand than pandemic, mitig ah, blah, blah, blah. pandemic mitigation strategies. Some wear masks, some don't wear masks, some take their shoes off before going to the house. Remember, we covered that a long time ago. Some just don't do anything. And still, yeah, that's a pretty strong ratio. So here we are, and we go down, 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 down. There's the world. New cases, smooth per million, increasing just a little bit. Vaccine going up a little bit, and there we are. And so do, 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 going down, there's our correlation. These don't make a difference, don't make a difference. Uh, new deaths per million world, still pretty high, but dropping rapidly. Uh, da, da, da. New deaths to new cases. So red is our mortality. Remember, we showed a decrease in that. And purple, we are seeing a rise in cases, but not a rise in mortality. Very vital. Uh, vaccine mortality percentage. Remember, we thought, you know, we looked at it uh, as people, more people getting vaccinated, the mortality percentage was going up. Well, that's uh, obviously changed. And that's what the data is for. So we can erase conspiracy. And so we're looking at the purple and we're looking at the mortality percentage. Nice separation there. Uh, really interesting. Uh, vaccine to mortality correlation. It's going away. Going away. Looking at the theoretical quantiles, and we'll maybe look at that next week. I had to rebuild a lot of data frames because of uh, a few of the data reporting agencies uh, no longer reporting. Uh, new deaths, cases per million worlds, so that took some time. And here we are, new cases. Look at what's happened there. This is total for continental-wise. South America is now above North America. And... That has not happened since June of last year. Interesting. All right. Asia. 
a uh, little bit of basic new cases smoothed. Africa, pretty low. It's actually some of the lowest levels in Africa since uh, May of 2020. Uh, they still have not corrected that data there from Spain. Don't know why, but that's Europe, North America, Oceania, uh, South America. There's that rise, and there's our plot for global level. And let's go back down. Let's go to our subplots here. Let's see what we have here. Yeah, this is South America again, and this is as of January. Uh, look at the precipitous drop in North America. Do, do, do. New cases overall. Uh, we've seen that has not changed that much uh, against about March 15th. Uh, Asia, though, over here, Africa. Remember, pay attention to your Y axis. Europe. Uh, nothing dramatic, really. We had the precipitous drop. And Oceania, you really can't count because, again, look at the y-axis, 60 compared to 250,000. Uh, North America has probably made – North America and Africa has probably made the greatest progress as far as dropping that arena. Uh, this one, you share the same y-axis, how it compares. That's the 250,000. That's from North America. And there we are there. But this is, gives you a good comparison as far as how the rest of the world sees it. Uh, new deaths, 300 uh, per day in Asia, down to about 160, 170. Africa is now down below 100. Europe, uh, about 400, a little around there. South America, see, that's the weird part about it. Look at that South American death rise right there. It's just increasing, but however, the North America is dropping in Oceania, again, very low. Uh, new deaths when you share on the y-axis. See right there? It's now past North America. Remember last week it did not. And again, you, when you're talking over 4.5 billion people in Asia, there, and you're looking at South America, you know, you really have to start wondering what is going on there. Doesn't mean it's going to affect us per se, but still, you have to keep an eye on that. New cases per million shared y-axis. Do, do, do. That means all the same here, 1,200 there, 1,200 new cases per million, nothing dramatic. Europe's still up there. Deaths per million, stabilized in Europe, dropping in Africa, nothing fancy for Asia. United States, nothing dramatic. Oceania, give you perspective. And then South America. And again, that's so looking about nine per million. Actually, it's less than that. Uh, Remember, we just looked at the chart. It was at 5 point something or 4.8 now for the United States. So let's look at that. Let's keep on going down. And that's it for that information. Let's go to the correlation global. Do, 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 do. All right, there we go. There is our heat map. And I don't like that color. Hang on a second. Let's just, let's just get another run through and see what pops up. And so that gives... Whoa, do, do, do. that's even worse. Let's go see what happens here. Yeah, it's glitched. Dang it. I'll fix that in a second. I don't know why it's doing that, but we will get it set in a little bit. But uh, otherwise, outside of that, it was just, uh, let's just run this one and come back to it. I want that to go away. All right, so let's go to our world mass data before we come back to this. Now, the world mass data is a real good example of how we're just getting tired with COVID data collection, which is probably not the ideal time to do that. Because if we got it on the run, let's confirm it. And therefore, individuals which are declaring a state of emergency or having states of emergency just a little bit too long, collecting the data is needed to basically dethrone of these feudal lords. So to proceed as follows. It's our dates. Uh, we're up to Zimbabwe. We're going to use our March. So that's March 8th. So I think we've probably gone a little further than that. But let's look at our data. Yeah, we just changed a little bit. Now we just have Syria and Vanatu. These are all the mask mandates, if those were called. And the reason I'm not going to use this data as much when it I'm going to scroll over pretty fast. I want to see if there's any change in the reporting data because we all know the United States is not classified as a four. 
uh, because there's so many states which are not uh, having any mask mandate at all. So it's kind of tough to throw the United States into the whole gambit per se. Uh, but Sweden, I like paying attention to these charts here where Sweden's at a two, when before the longest period of time they were at nothing. But once they started incorporating masks, it had an interesting uh, effect on their caseloads going up. Just a correlation, uh, but interesting to say. Let's see. All right, there we go as far as the mask level. And the, again, without paying attention to the mask level, let's see if anything pops up here that's interesting. Um, you know, here's the deaths per million. See the Sweden thing with the, they raised the mask. And there's the deaths per million going down. Uh, there's the mass level, but the case of a million seem to go up. Uh, it doesn't seem to have any direct effect. Uh, but however, though, as far as tests per thousands, the tests per thousands are going up. You see the psychological gambit there in the case of a million. Right about the exact same time, what is that, February? Right about the exact same time they started throwing into the mask gambit. So they raised the mass level in January to one, and then started increasing their testing, and then they started coming up with more cases. And so let's go, Columbia will pass over, Japan, pretty much stable. Uh, they're testing, and the cases per million, are down pretty low. New Zealand, still out of the game. Uh, Finland, this will caught me off guard a little bit. The test per thousand, the cases per million. Uh, they seem to go hand in hand. Interesting. India, not much. Uh, nice separation there between extra uh, tests per thousand and cases per million. I like to see that grow. The more you test, the less case you find. That's a good sign. Spain, again, data collection seems to be a little torqued, but there it is. There's your deaths per million. And there's your uh, mass level, which we're not going to pay attention to much anymore. Uh, again, sloppy data reporting. No clue what went on with that. Uh, but they, again, we saw that in the first one. We caught that. There it is. And their test per thousand and their case per million. Uh, pretty innocuous. I can't tell how accurate it is. France. Looks like everything's pretty much okay. United Kingdom. Great success story here as far as the drop. Don't know if the pandemic mitigation strategy had much of an effect in any of it. From a global scale, it looks like with our controls, there was no difference. And we're going to look at our state levels in a second. United Kingdom, look at this. They are curious. This is what you want to see. They are testing like crazy. Look at, the, look at them testing more tests than they ever did. Look at their case level. It's like they're sitting in a state of disbelief. But that's pretty amazing. Positive for United Kingdom. Italy, uh, separation there, the more you test, the more case you find, interesting. And then our rest of our data. Let's go back to here real fast, we investigate in correlations. There's a better heat map. All right, there you are. And the heat map, looking at any stringency index whatsoever, I don't know if you can read those numbers, but it's in 4K. It takes a few days to, to isolate, but no correlation with stringency index and any benefit whatsoever, at least from that level. Uh, looking for here, looking for yellows uh, to see if there's any strong correlation uh, with anything. No, that's just the median age and age and so on and so forth. Uh, 0.73, again, female smokers in age 70 over. I'll keep on focusing on that one. If you could see one that's really high, remember you wanna go find a 0.7 or greater uh, to find some sort of uh, strong correlation. If there's a 0.79 human development index, I mean, age, we'll see what I mean. Life expectancy, human development index, uh, 0.66. Nope. Again, I'm not seeing anything health wise or, or pandemic mitigation wise. It seems to be making a difference. All right, let's go down. We did this before, did that before. Let's scroll down, scroll down. Uh, United States is improving its position. There it is right there. We're just doing a little worse than Chile. Remember when we first started this at 3.6? Now I think it's down to 4.28. Still twice as much as Sweden, but still, 
getting better and getting back down to that level, which hopefully by next week we should be back down to there. All right, and that's the information there. Let's go back down to COVID states that they're gone. The last report of information from this database was March 7th. All right, so we're going to drop that database. Hospital occupancy, it's gone. This API, for whatever reason, is now defunct as well. Just giving the data analyst out there a little bit of a heads up. Sites are beginning to become um, glitched or not being maintained. All right, let's go to our hospital occupancy rate. This is we're doing with the vaccines. So let's go real fast. Please forgive me if I'm speaking just a little monotone. It is, again, past midnight, and we've had a busy day over here today. All right, and plus it took a lot of time to redo the data analytics, uh, data collection from the CDC. You'll see why in a second. Here we go. Do, do, do. Vaccine bar parts. Blah. Um, and we're looking at there is vaccine distribution, do, do, do. jurisdictions. We click at that. I did that. All right. This, again, this deals with those, if it's perfect vaccine, full delivery. Uh, this is how many people have been vaccinated per population. That's why the drop in cases and things like that, he has a correlation in the introduction of the vaccine. But reality is statistically significant wise, that'd be hard pressed. And if we had full delivery, this is how many vaccines should have been injected both first and second. Johnson & Johnson, I hope to include pretty soon, but that's what we're looking at. So if everything was perfect and logistics was perfect and administration was perfect, that's the percentage of the population in each one of these states that should be vaccinated. And uh, basically, da, 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 da. so looking right here, All right, I'm looking right there, the percentage-wise, 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 do, 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 that should have been updated. Some of these have not been updated as much. Let's go back to our other one real fast. I want to see one thing real fast. Hang on. Let's look at our rebuild. I want to check our date of our vaccine administration to see if it's correlating with that one real fast. Hang on. Ah, it's annoying. Let's stop that there. All right, that's what we got here. We're looking at the vaccines and population. So looking at vaccine delivery, weeks of allocation. Let's look right here. Here we are. And so look at March 15th. All right, so we're going to ignore the last one. And let's work with our new data. New, uh, because, again, there's been a lot of glitches. So let's work with our new data here. All right, here we go. A lot of files to merge. I'll show you in a second. With populations, so on and so forth, and the mathematics that had to involve. This is all the columns. After I had to merge the super database uh, from dealing with these data from all from the CDC, which is right up here. But besides that, let's begin. Let's look at this. Do, 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 do. All right, here we go. Our first one. Percent of hospitalized patients to pay, uh, compare it to COVID patients. So this is each state. So this red line has indicated the COVID patients in the hospital. And the purple line has indicated the number of inpatient beds total. So this is the inpatient bed occupancy, not as percentage, but as a total. Uh, I decided to use those columns instead as, used, as opposed to using the percentage. So this is how many inpatient beds there are. These are how many inpatient beds in each state that is being utilized by COVID patients. And I'm going to scroll to this real slow in case you see your state and you want to pause it. And again, it's set to the 15th, so it, it, they, they kind of like forward their date. So you understand what I mean. And so there we are, inpatient beds available compared to COVID patients being used. All right, get reading through that, that. I'm just going slow. So you can pause it as need be. Before we get to the good stuff. There's that, just going almost done. Yeah, it doesn't seem, again, when you look at this data, it, you remember the original reason why we went to go flatten the curve is we went to go flatten the curve because we were worried about the hospital being overwhelmed. Remember the, the tents and the parks and things like that? The data here doesn't support it. 
Uh, let's begin. New deaths per thousand, no mask, loose restriction states. Now, what I did here, this data frame right here, these are all the states which are pretty much loose on the restrictions currently. And so what we're doing is we're selecting those states and looking at that data. Now, the objective you have here as a policymaker is you have to look at this data and see if there's a difference between states which pretty much balked at the idea of pandemic restrictions as opposed to those states that did not. So remember, each one has a different y-axis to be fair, but let us proceed. I'm going to go slow, and this is per 100,000. So you see 0.8 per 100,000, whatever it is. These are your states, which basically, and this is again, deaths per 100,000. They basically have loose restrictions. Interesting here, again, it's part of the data anomaly, which we spot, but just to give you an idea. Uh, new deaths per 100,000 and tight restriction states. I know visually it's kind of tough to compare, but this is just to give you an idea. Do you, I mean, seriously, can you give me a strong difference visually? Mathematically, I'm sure we can derive some, but like, for example, even a tight restriction state, you wonder why mathematically you have these weird spikes. And I, to me, personally, I think it's just data dumping, trying to get caught up on, um, on missing time. And you notice that often, you'll see for right here, right here, and right here, this just tells me potentially we have sloppy reporting going on, which is going to make it real tough to make strong, solid policy decisions with just arbitrary reporting. And so here we are. And that's your states in regard to that. These are all the states with tight restrictions. Now we're going to compare new deaths per 100,000. Blue is your tight restrictions right there. And I'll make this font a little bigger next time. Green is your loose. You see how they go over here? Blue right here. And actually, this is green, but still, you get, you, you get the idea. This gives you a solid comparison as far as controls. Now, knowing the collateral damage that basically lockdowns can do, you as a policymaker have to make a decision basically saying, hey, is the is that damage, or I keep on using the word collateral, to the economy, to businesses, to individuals, to schools, and so on and so forth, justifiable? If basically our control states are showing no worse outcomes than our tight restriction states in reference to one, myopic goal. Proceed forward. This is the same thing just with lines. Mortality. Here's our grids. Again, it's still kind of tough to show, but this is total mortality since the whole pandemic. Certain states basically, obviously like California here, are way outside the spectrum. Uh, Texas, for example, is part of your loose restriction states. Um, probably the closest we have to California. But you see right here, this is all the states together. New deaths per 100,000. Again, you're a policymaker. Now, this is a example of all fairness. This is the loose restriction states. Uh, let's see if the, how that bounces out. Right there. New cases per 100,000. You see the data anomaly? One state can throw it off. They just dump their data. It can affect policy decisions for the rest of the country. But again, this is on the loose states. New cases per 100,000 and tight restriction states. There's the data. I'm going to move slowly. As you can see. Similar pattern. Isn't that the amazing part? The similar pattern in all states, in different geographies, population densities, so on and so forth. Uh, again, it, the correlation is just, is just confounding. Uh, no, I shouldn't say confound. That's a bad word to term. It is, it is how you're awestruck by the correlation because it, someone has to dig into and find out why. You want to find out why. Can there have been a drift or a shift in the virus so dramatic, regardless of the variants out there, that you have this similar drop? Now, these are loose restriction states as far as cases 100,000 so from the beginning of the pandemic. That you have that similar effect, except for, thank you, Missouri, again, data collection, that's the one that threw the, the whole chart off. Uh, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Texas, uh, been in the news quite a bit. 
there's your, again, we're dealing with new cases per 100,000. North Dakota, pretty low. There's our Florida. There you see them partying at the beach, spring break, so on and so forth. And the sky has not fallen. New case per 100,000, no mask, loose restriction states. Now what we're doing is we're starting from January 21st. Give you a good comparison in a short duration of time. Thank you, Missouri. And you see right here. And no, no the problem is they'll never correct it. So I'll, let's hopefully they do correct it. And But here it goes. There's that. Oklahoma, these are your loose restriction states. And look at the drop. Look at the precipitous drop. New case per 100,000 in tight restriction states. Again, they definitely have different y-axis, but it's you're trying to determine the pattern as opposed to basically the total number from different population bases, so on and so forth. Look at that. Again, these are your tight restriction states. What happened here? Interesting. But still, you, you start noticing little drops like that. That's like, look at that. Is that weird or what? Just literally... How? How do you have that happen? It's such an incredible correlation. Let's keep on going. It's, it's again, it just amazes me. That's, I know why they withhold comment on it because they're still looking at it dumbfounded. Uh, but that gives you information as far as the data per se. I'll build these databases a little bit more and look for more reliable sources or smooth out the data at least uh, so we can get more of a visual on there. But let us begin to review everything that we have seen today. Let's stop right over here and do this per 100,000. Again, boom, 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 boom. You're a policymaker. you got to make policy. You have populations which want to get back out and get things going. You're comparing your states, which have very loose restrictions and no restrictions, compared to states that have high restrictions. See, that's weird too. Look at this. The deaths per 100,000 uh, in the states with the tightest restrictions in the beginning seem to be the most traumatized. Now, why is it that basically in the states with the loosest restrictions, you're looking at this, in the beginning had nowhere near the same mortality outcome? Something to think about. But again, that's for future epidemiologists. I'm just an amateur. But to proceed as follows, let's look review what we have reviewed today so going backwards exercise is safe for healthy people wearing masks but no one's debating whether it's safe or not but performance wise that was a 10 percent reduction in our ability to basically exercise after 30 minutes i believe uh, but again not to be more than researchers these people did it pretty much on their own free time and their own cognition and free will and they are calling for larger studies, which I shouldn't be having to volunteer in order to do a study on something this important. This should be funded. But proceed as follows. It's time to start looking at basically what's going to happen to future generations. Because in their words right here, deficits normally occur in order for us to take care of those individuals which have been affected either through PTSD or otherwise in the future. We have to start asking some hard questions now. Next, after that, real-world data re reveals uh, blah, 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 the allergic reaction to the COVID-19. The CDC was only off by, they said, 0.11 per 10,000 vaccines. Massachusetts General Hospital, after doing its survey, noticed 2.47 after 10,000 individuals. So how far off is that? Well, I'm waiting for someone else to tell me. But again, just to give you an idea how much little they know when we, something enters the real world, it could be more positive than anticipated or more negative. Again, it just gives you an idea you have to respect on how little we actually do know, especially with this new type of inoculation. I'm not going to use the word vaccine because mRNA, uh, the way they're doing it, is not traditional in a way. It's like trying to reprogram the immune system. Uh, I think a better word would be utilize inoculation to some extent, something similar to that, but not, not traditional vaccine. But to proceed as follows, lockdown reduces cognitive capacity. Interesting. Again, there'll be links to the studies. Face masks, third report I found out. First one was basically disposable face masks being a vector for disease transmission. 
Second one, remember we did a face mask being used to be recycled to manufacture roads. And of course now, face masks are basically uh, environmental catastrophe. It contained a lot of things in there, which normally we try to avoid on a daily basis. But honestly, even myself, I did not realize we're actually in the face masks. Bisphenol A, put right over your mouth all day. And heavy metals and other pathogenic work, microorganisms. No wonder people's skin is drying out and it's prematurely aging people around the mouth. Yeah, that's one of the side effects too. And coronavirus variants. Wow. That is just amazing. Again, you can either look at it myopically uh, in order to say, hey, you know, should we throw all of our eggs into one basket and focus on a vaccine? Or two, my preferred route without any publisher bias is strengthening the immune capacity of individuals. So no matter what the potential uh, threat may be, they can at least have some capacity in which to adapt and evolve past whatever that threat may possibly lead to in the future. Because obviously, coronavirus SARS is not the only thing that's going to be. Would you rather have a strong immune system capable of adapting to any sort of uh, potential uh, I would say viral threat or bacterial threat, or would you rather wait six months to a year, and even in the best circumstances, a vaccine to be developed ex post facto? No, or would you say ex post facto? Well, the vaccine coming out after the fact is nowhere near going to be on target as a strong immune system of today. The vaccine tomorrow will never do as well as a strong immune system of today. Of course, with the way things spread and the way the vectors, waiting a year. Yeah, you can have a, a pretty strong transmission rate throughout a society. Better to be a strong immune system. Or at least maybe we do both. Have a strong immune system that could hold you off until the vaccine does come out. Sounds pretty good. All right. Otherwise, again, I'll put the, uh, uh, all the information, the links on there. And thank you to our world and data for still being there. And even then, healthdata.gov, I appreciate it. And the CDC, as far as having the data available to at least access, one of the few remaining databases out there. Still, even though I knock from time to time, I still appreciate the data being collected so we could uh, basically uh, filter through it and pull out the information which we've presented to you today. Ralph Sergeant Channel signing off. Thank you for bearing with me. It is now the 14th of March, and I forget it's daylight saving time as well, so I'll catch you all in a bit. Bye.